Hi, my name is Scott Simpson, and today we'll be talking about electrolytes. So um, in the next lab that you have to perform, uh, you'll be using electrolytes and you'll be using conductivity meters to try and measure uh, the conductance of these electrolytes. And from this, we can infer if uh, this system is a strong electrolyte, legal, weak electrolyte, or a non-electrolytic solution. So let's start by defining what an electrolyte is. An electrolyte is a substance that yields ions in solution. So a classic example of this is table salt. You take table salt, um, you throw it into a solution, a solvent of water, and what happens is, is you can watch those, those salt particles start to dissolve, right? And what's actually happening is, is these ions in this three-dimensional lattice are getting broken apart by the water molecules and they're, they're dispersed throughout the solution. So uh, what ends up happening is, is you have a lattice that looks something like this that extends out in three dimensions. I'm only gonna draw it in two dimensions. And then water molecules will come in. They'll coordinate to these ions. So as the, we have chlorine minus ions and we have sodium plus ions. So what happens is, as water molecules come in, they hydrate these systems. So in the case of a sodium, which is a positively charged ion or a cation, the oxygens will point towards the sodium. Ooh, my pen's not gonna work. Let's try this one. and they'll interact that way. And eventually these water molecules, will, they'll pull the sodium out of the lattice. So time. It's yellow minus. Sorry, these aren't drawn to size. Chlorine should actually be larger. And we have a vacancy in here, but what ends up happening is, is the sodium, this cation, it's surrounded by water molecules. And this is known as a sphere of hydration. So what will happen is, is you'll see this, this solid start to dissolve and these ions go into solution. Now, depending on how many of the ions go into solution and the conductivity of the sample, you might have a strong or a weak or a non-electrolytic solution. So this has to deal with the electrolyte strength. So when we use the term strength, when we're discussing electrolytes, and that includes acids and bases, what we're really talking about is the ability to dissociate. into ions. So the ability to break apart into ions. And we have three different situations or three um, divisions that we'll talk about. We have strong electrolytes. We have weak electrolytes. And then we have non-electrolytes. Let's move this out a little bit. And non-electrolytes. So as we discuss, when we say, when we're talking about strength, we're talking about the ability to dissociate into ions. So a strong electrolyte would completely dissociate. where a non-electrolyte, as you can guess, would not dissociate. So no dissociation. Whereas weak electrolytes, weak electrolytes partially break apart. So they partially dissociate. Now, what about their conductivity? So um, most of the time, 
uh, when you when you have a lot of ions in solution, electricity can permeate throughout that media. So in this case, a strong electrolyte would have a high conductivity. And a non-electrolyte would have no conductivity. And a weak electrolyte would have a low amount of conductivity, a low conductance. So let's, let's consider a system, magnesium chloride. A lot of times we would write magnesium chloride with an aqueous symbol afterwards. This is a strongly electrolytic solution. So we know in reality, this system is gonna dissociate into ions. So we would have Mg2 plus, aqueous, which we, we know from our oxidation state rules. We have, have chlorine minus, which we also know from our oxidation state rules. Now these two are actually equivalent to one another. Um, a lot of times we write this shorthand, or, or excuse me, we write this shorthand this way. Um, this would be considered the ionic equation, and this side would be considered the molecular equation. But in reality, they mean the same thing. Most of the time, chemists are lazy and we write it this way just to save on space or to save on writing. But we know in reality what we're talking about is this ionic equation. Uh, when this is dissolved in solution, we know that we have magnesium two plus ions floating around and chlorine two, or excuse me, one minus ions floating around. So now that brings us to the discussion of acids. So knowing what we know, if we have a strong acid or a weak acid, what do we know about their ability to dissociate? Well, we know a strong acid would completely dissociate. And a weak acid would partially dissociate. There are a couple, there are many strong acids and many weak acids. Some that you may have to know for your courses. Uh, for example, I make my students know that HCl, hydrochloric acid, is a strong acid where hydrofluoric acid, HF, is a weak acid. Now, acid strength has nothing to deal with reactivity. And that's a really important point. That's a common misconception that most people have. So acid strength does not have to deal with its reactivity. Does not have to with reactivity. It only relates to the ability to dissociate. Oops, only the ability to dissociate. And that's important to keep in mind because um, HCl, HCl is dangerous, but hydrofluoric acid is way more dangerous. Hydrofluoric acid can react with glass, uh, can eat through metal. It, if you watch Breaking Bad, it's used to dissolve bodies because it goes through bone, it, it gets everything. So in terms of reactivity, HF is kind of way more dangerous than hydrochloric acid. Both of them aren't fun. I wouldn't want them on my skin, but um, you have to work with a lot of protective gear. And you can't even use gla like conventional glassware when you work with hydrofluoric acid. So to demonstrate this, uh, I have looked up a table uh, of conductivity. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna keep track of the substance. And this is at 25 degrees C. So we have one molar hydrochloric acid and we have one molar hydrofluoric acid. And then we're gonna keep track of the conductivity. 
which has some crazy units. That's the way the device works. If you look this up, what you'll find is it's about 332.2. Um, when we're considering hydrofluoric acid, it's 24.3. Uh, what is this? This is Siemens times centimeters squared per mole. So this is a molar conductivity, essentially. So it's been um, normalized through moles rather than grams or something else. So you can look, the conductivity of hydrochloric acid is way higher compared to hydrofluoric acid. So what does that mean? Well, when we have hydrochloric acid in solution, this is considered a strong acid, it completely dissociates. It breaks apart into H plus aqueous or hydronium and Cl minus aqueous. Now, if we're considering hydrofluoric acid, on the other hand, hydrofluoric acid, well, we know that it is, oh, a weak acid based upon its conductivity. So we know it should want to break apart into H plus and to F minus, but at a much smaller rate. This is actually an equilibrium. So uh, what's happening is, is there are two competing reactions. There's a forward reaction, and then there's also a reverse reaction. And the rate of these reactions is e equal to one another at equilibrium. So in the case of hydrofluoric acid, we can think about, or excuse me, hydrochloric acid, we can think about it as H plus and Cl minus in solution. Whereas hydrofluoric acid, most of the particles are actually still in this molecular unit, this HF, but some of them have broken apart and that's where the reactivity comes into play. So um, when you're considering Conductivities and acid strengths and electrolyte strengths, remember, it's the ability to, to dissociate that matters. It is not the reactivity. So with that, I have nothing more to add. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And thank you for watching.